Hi everybody and welcome back. Today we are going to be going back into our favorite lore videos and today I thought that we would be starting things off with the very basic building block of Final Fantasy XIV and we are going to be talking about ether and etherology. This is going to be a video about what exactly it is, how it works, and why it's so important so I hope you're going to be looking forward to it. So. Why don't we start with the important question of asking, just what is ether? Well, to put it in a simple way, ether is the most basic building block of all creation in the world of Hydaelyn. Not only that, but it's also the very life energy upon which the schools of magic are drawn from Final Fantasy XIV. Without knowledge of ether and how it works, scholars would be unable to understand the world and how anything works. Within all beings, whether it be man, animal, or even plants, do they have the flow of ether? It's the spark which grants life to lifeless. Conversely, death can be said to occur once ether has left the corporeal object. From this, it's clear to see why many scholars use the words life and ether interchangeably. It can be assumed that a young man of sound mind and body will possess a higher concentration of ethereal energies in his younger years, whereas he would in an older man, or one inflicted with corruption will not. Some scholars have even expanded upon this hypothesis saying that the consumption of food serves not only to fill the belly, but to provide the body with ether that was lost during the day. Ether is not by any means static, though. It's constantly flowing through creation, forming currents through the earth, the water, the air, and ensuring that life is sustained throughout the world. If these currents should ever stop flowing, then it's going to be like you stopping someone's hearts. Ether is the very lifeblood of Hydaelyn. Without it, the world and everybody on it would die. Manipulation of ether is a manner that divides from its natural tendencies in what scholars would call magic. While the various schools of magic such as thaumaturgy and skundry all employ different methods, the basic concept is still the same. Being able to manipulate the flow of ether in one's own body to be able to manipulate the surrounding environment. A similar yet more primitive type of ethereal manipulation can be seen in non-sentient beings, such as a raptor breathing fire or a blast that's about to explode. These are all examples of lesser-born creatures utilizing the ether within their own bodies or available ether from the nearby environment to hunt or protect themselves from harm. There exist some objects which are believed to toe the line between organic and inorganic, gems being one such example. Arcanists tip the scale in favor of life by drawing ether into the stones, which allows them to be able to summon creatures known as the carbuncles. Ethereal energies can be divided into six distinctive elements. We have fire, wind, lightning, water, ice, and earth. Now, these elements provide nature with aspects that govern how they act in the world. For example, if there's a region where the ethereal currents are more aspected towards fire, they're generally going to be a lot hotter and drier than in the region that would have, let's say, ice aspected currents, which is more likely to be characterized by frigid climates. In addition to the six elements, there also exist two poles. We have the astral and the umbral, which greatly influence the nature of the elements. An astral change bringing more activity, while an umbral change resulting in more passiveness. If a thaumaturge was in the astral state, then their fire spells are bound to be a lot more powerful. If in the umbral state, then it's going to be a little bit weaker. It really all depends on what kind of a state of mind you have. Ether refers to the energy found throughout the world of Hydaelyn in Final Fantasy XIV. And as I said before, it is the source of both magic and life, and the disruption of its flow is either the cause or the indicator of catastrophic events, such as in the case of the umbral eras. Ether is released from the body upon death and then disappears from the physical realm. Only so much of it can cross over at a time, however, and any access remains in the form of glowing mist, crystals, or even ghostly apparitions. As ether is akin to soul energy, more violent and dramatic deaths tend to yield more excess of ether. When a living entity arrives on the scene of a battle, no matter how ancient, this access of ether will enter this new host and expand its native ether. Ether flows throughout the entire planet, and places where it collects most are typically very vivid, very lush, particularly in the Black Shroud. The Black Shroud is so rich in ether that 
Sentient, elementally aspected ether beings known as the elementals are able to reign over the wood. So much ether was just pulled together to create these beings that they basically are life energy given form. However, while it is the source of all life on Earth, ether is also very dangerous in high concentrations. This often causes afflicted to become more aggressive, if not completely mad, and monster and ether abundant areas become much more threatening, such as in the case of Eureka. The ether there is so warped and powerful that the creatures that are already powerful and dangerous there only grew ever more dangerous. As for the case with the primals, they are called to the physical realm and sustained by massive amounts of ether. Now the beast tribes who worship them hoard these crystals and when they feel like they have enough they will attempt to summon it. The more crystals that are gathered together, the more ether is fed to the primal and as such they become much more powerful. However, over time this ether will eventually run out so they will continue to have to suck the land dry of ether as well as claim other poor unsuspecting victims as their servants as their thralls in order to help sustain their bodies. Now up till now we haven't seen the primals as too great a threat to the land because we usually deal with them very quickly. However, on a long term scale primals will consume the ether from the lands and if left unchecked they would just continue to drain the land of ether until there's nothing left. In the patch of 4.3 we are introduced to the burn which was apparently once a very beautiful, very lush environments before repeated summonings of primals who were left unchecked for such a long periods of time that they just sucked the land dry until there was nothing left but a dead wasteland. This is what's going to happen to the world if the primals are allowed to remain as they are, if they are allowed to remain in this world and that they are allowed to continue to suck the land. That's why the warrior of light is so powerful, like so important to the story because they are able to deal with these primals and return all the ether that they took back into the land. In some cases, overexposure of a primal's ether can cause mutations in the living beings, such in the case as the Sahagin with their primal Leviathan. To punish the serpent reavers who failed them, these pirates were exposed to massive over-aspected water ether for a prolonged period of time until they were mutated into abominations that were much more marine life than people anymore. Many if not all forms of life possess a degree of etherical manipulation which allows them to manipulate their environment or perform rudimentary magic. And what I mean is basically everybody in the world of Hydaelyn is born with at least a little bit of ability to control their ether, they're able to control magic, with the exception to this rule being the Garlean race. For some reason, the Garleans lack this natural ability to manipulate their own ether. They can't use magic. At least the pure-blooded Garleans are unable to use magic. This isolated them from other nations in Ishabard and forced them to develop their cerulean-based magic to compensate. Cerulean is a neon blue substance, which is a special kind of ether that's refined in reactors. It's very volatile and it's used to fuel the Garlean technology, much of which was borrowed for Eorzea, it's used in such things such as making the airships and powered small devices. However, this stuff is very dangerous, it's very corrosive and very volatile, like I said, because even just a spark comes in contact with a crate of cerulean it would create a region-wide devastation akin to a nuclear blast. So this kind of stuff is something that needs to be handled with care. Now as we now know, when a being dies and, since, and their ether returns to the planet, not all their ether is able to pass through to the ethereal sea at once and much of it is left behind, usually in the form of crystals. Now these crystals are used by the disciples of hand for synthesis and for crafting. Their largest forms are clusters, but single crystals and shards are used for most recipes. Now each crystal has an elemental aspect, such as wind or fire, and you're going to be needing these crystals to craft anything at all. Ether concentrations can even affect things like the weather, like we have the gloom in Mordona, which appears in some kind of a purple miasma. In addition to limiting visibility, it can alter the effectiveness of certain spells and abilities, and it can make your magic much more powerful. However, it can also make creatures who live within these areas a lot more vicious as well. 
Nearly all primals will drastically affect the weather around them as soon as they're summoned, such as in the form of Bismarck, who is the Lord of the Mists and can manipulate the weather however he sees fit. Now, Aether exists beyond the planet and can be harnessed, such as in the form of the Alagon civilization, who use both the Crystal Tower and Dalamoon to collect and store Aether from sunlight. Then the practices of the Charlian astrology can also harness Aether from the constellations into their own magics. How this is done, we're really not entirely sure yet, but they use some kind of tools to kind of draw the Aether from outside the planet, like from the very stars and the heavens itself, kind of like solar energy, and is then manipulated into a new form of ether, which we can unleash in the form of magic. Over time, etherical shifts can occur, and this was one of the first signs of the impending Severinth Umbral Era, and the generally a hallmark of the rejoining phenomenon and the cycle of eras. Neil Van Darnus used vast amounts of ether to bring Dalumun down from the sky, and because of this, the land itself was just warped to beyond recognition, and certain aspects of ether have changed, such as, like I said before, in the form of Ishgard probably being the most prominent. It was once a very green, very luscious wilderness, but, but because of the etheric shifts from Dalamun, the ether that flows through the lands of Ishgard somehow were transformed to be replaced with ice, and as such, the new land has to take on a form that represents that. In other words, it's now a land of ice and snow that never seems to stop snowing. Another example of this is when Midgard Summer attacked the Agrius back in the Silver Tear Falls. The massive blast from the battle, which not only destroyed the Agrius, but it completely warped the land around Mordona, turning the green forest into, into a crystal-hewn wasteland, basically. When a living entity dies, the ether remaining will normally leave the body and return to the world's ethereal currents, also known as the life stream. When a living entity, however, experiences death-inducing trauma, such as a mortal wound or a deadly spell, the resulting sudden release of its most heavily aspected life energy will oftentimes manifest corporeally before it can return to the life stream, a phenomenon we know as crystals. This can also occur when a wound is dealt to the very land itself, and is a reason why crystal deposits are found throughout the land. The elemental aspects of the energy trapped in these crystals can be harnessed and used in, the, in a myriad of manners. Applying fire crystals to a forge can increase its internal temperature, assisting in the smelting of ore. The cooling properties of an ice crystal can assist in a grocer maintaining the freshness of meat or produce. That said, due to extreme concentration of aspected ether within a crystal, direct consumption of a crystal lay in living beings can severely alter the ethereal balance within the body, ultimately resulting in severe injury or death. So in other words, people, don't eat the crystals. It's very bad for you. Etherologists believe that existence occurs on two separate but overlapping planes, the corporeal realm, where we reside, and the ethereal realm, who, more namely a realm without substance, but containing the essence of all creation. When an item in the corporeal realm dies or is destroyed, its ether passes back into the ever-flowing currents of the ethereal realm, in other words, the life stream. When something new is born in the corporeal realm, it is granted life with energy from the life stream. Thus, a natural balance is maintained between the two worlds. Now, each plane exerts influence on the other, the proximity of the two determining the scope of that influence. In places of close proximity, the ethereal plane exerts a great amount of influence on the corporeal plane, and vice versa. The corporeal plane benefits from this proximity by becoming rich in abundant ether, something that promotes life and growth. Conversely, locations where there is distance between the corporeal and the ethereal planes are thought to suffer from harsh climbs and be characteristically void of life. If for some reason one plane were to become irreparably damaged, the other would also suffer, leading to the eventual collapse of both. As was stated above, when the planes draw close in proximity, they equally exert influence over each other. We have already given an example of how the corporeal plane benefits from the influence, but what of the ethereal plane? One manner of measurable influence is how corporeal can be maintained while 
in a state of pure ether. This ultimately allows for the travel of corporeal beings through the ethereal planes without the loss of ties to the being's own plane. In simpler terms, it renders teleportation, magics that are wielded to reduce a body and its will to ethereal components and cross over the ethereal plane. While there, the will of the host is maintained, allowing him to travel almost instantaneously to other locations in the plane, when he then crosses back, regaining its corporeal form. To accomplish this, however, the host requires special beacons, the points of subjects where he needs to be. Etherites, massive concentration of crystallized ether, serve as beacons or lighthouses, most often appearing in areas where the corporeal and the ethereal planes are the closest. Now these areas are usually teeming with life because of this proximity, which is why centers of population can be found near etherites. Without these beacons, an ethereal will will merely drift in the life stream for eternity, slowly breaking down into the most basic form of pure ether until Heidelin gives those particles new form. Historically, settlements have been established around existing deposits of etherites, areas teeming with life due to their proximity to the ethereal plane. However, the Charlians, despite a lack of comprehension regarding the process involved, have succumbed in applying technology from previous ages to the construction of portable etherites which can be placed in almost any location. I know this all sounds really complicated, but basically what it comes down to is when we teleport, our bodies transform into pure ether and we're able to travel along the life stream. However, once we enter the live stream, we have trouble finding our way out, which is why we have the etherite crystals set up in, in the cities and the settlements. They act the part as lighthouses. They help us find our way out of the live stream, basically, which is why in Charlian, the teleportation spell flow is considered to be forbidden and dangerous. It's dangerous because the reason it's considered dangerous is because... Usually when a person teleports, they have a location in mind, and they use their thoughts to be able to travel the live stream and guide them to the lighthouse of the etherite currents to that exact location. However, when using the spell of flow, it doesn't use an etherite crystal as a beacon. Basically, you can travel anywhere in the world with the spell of flow, and you don't have to waste your time like chanting a really complicated, powerful spell all the time. However, it doesn't have a guaranteed exit. That's the tricky part. A person can very easily become trapped within the life stream. So when you use the spell of flow, it's kind of a 50-50 chance of whether or not you'll be able to escape the life stream. This is shown very clearly when Yeshtola used the flow spell when escaping from Udal with Thancred. Thancred ended up escaping the live stream, but he had no control over his destination. He ended up in the Dravanian forelands, whereas Yastola ended up trapped there for some time until the Seed Seer was able to actually peer into the live stream and help pull her out. Now, while both of them did manage to escape the live stream eventually, it definitely caused some kind of effects on them. In Bankrat's case, for some reason, he just can't manipulate his own ether anymore. He can't use magic, including teleportation spells. In Yastola's case, she can't see anymore. She was robbed of her sight. That's why her eyes are so blank now. She can't see anything. However, she also can sense ether so much clearer now. So she's able to see, in a sense, by basically sensing the ether around her. And since everything is made up of ether... She can see as a kind of second sight, I suppose you could say it is. She can just sense where everything is. All in all, teleportation is a very dangerous business. And being stuck in the live stream for too long can basically turn you into little particles. That is why they were in such a hurry to get Yastola out of the live stream before her body was completely broken down. Some scholars in the field of ethereology further believe that somewhere deep beneath the land slumber a massive concentration of ethereal life energy. Now, these etherologists refer to this phenomena as the mother crystal. Still, some take this hypothesis one step further, stating that the existence of a mother crystal proves that the planet itself is alive and represents a heretofore unclassified biological entry. 
To support this theory, they point to the oracles and heroes of ancient history who claim unexplainable visions of the future or unnatural strength to overcome impossible odds. The scholars believe that it is through these visions that the planet is conveying messages to those she entreats to aid her with the reoccurrences themes of Heidelin's will or the will of lights, which appear in the myths and folklore of seemingly unrelated civilizations as proof of this belief. A focal point of Charlian academia has forever been to understand and predict Heidelin's fate. One intriguing fact is that the scholars have uncovered is that the deeper into the planet's core one ventures, the more blurred the border between the corporeal and the ethereal realms become, leading many etherologists to believe that if you were to travel deep enough into the earth, they may be able to witness and examine the ethereal realm while maintaining their corporeal forms. Any attempts by the Charlians to test this hypothesis was put into motion with the construction of the Anti-Tower near the Charlian city-state in the Dravanian hinterlands. Built deep beneath the surface of Heidelin, the tower focuses ether into powerful magics, which pry open a window into the ethereal realm, giving mankind its first ever glimpse into the, into the ethereal sea. Direct contact with the Mother Crystal was the next step in Charlian's research before the scholars were forced to flee Eorzea following the Garlean Empire's invasion of the realm. So while ether is the source of all life, it is also very dangerous and can very easily destroy as well as protect. Ether is part of a series-wide trend that is of a supernatural substance to explain the origins of magic, of crystals, of life, and other phenomena. We've seen this include such as the mist, miasma, the life stream, and mako from the other Final Fantasy games. However, out of all of them, ether seems to be the closest to the life stream. Both occur naturally and multiple degrees of density, which are both poisonous at extreme levels. Anyway, that's all I have to say about etherology for the time being. I hope that this video was informative and that you understand just exactly what is ether and what makes it so important in the land of Hydaelyn. If Eorzea is ever to recover, we're going to have to find a way to take care of the ethereal streams once and for all. Anyway, just let me know what you thought of my video and hopefully I'll be able to make some more lore videos soon. Until then, take care.